Uh, it looks like David is frozen again. Experience some delays in the feed. My screen is. It's probably all this wind today in the and reboot. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was saying you know, my screen's going in and out, and and sound since from some people's going in and out. It may have something to do with the wind. Um, we'll we'll plow through. Uh, this morning, <laughs> Rinaldi is back to do our invocation again, and then Dave Williamson will lead our pledge. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We are. Um, this prayer was was given to me by Faye Harriet, who was supposed to be here today, but she's off skiing in Vail. But this was written by a fellow Rotarian, so she wanted me to share this with you. In times of fear and panic, let us be the source of calm. Let those who are trembling find us safe to lean upon. May we be the voice of reason. May we comfort the oppressed. May we show our compassion to those who are most distressed. Amen. Good morning. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Where is David? He's probably rebooting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we seem to have lost him completely. Can I make an announcement while we're waiting for him? Sure. Yeah, as I say, announcements. <laughs> okay. Um, I am going to be, well, I am heading up community services uh, for the club now and uh, looking for people to join my committee. So if anybody has an interest, uh, just email me or message me on, on this um, Zoom call and I'd love to add you on. Really, I need uh, folks who are gonna be um, um, uh, helping me approve what we're gonna be sponsoring and that sort of thing, as well as just heading up the different aspects of the, of the committee, which includes parade marshaling, um, Salvation Army and uh, the food pantry. Roberta is already on the committee. Uh, we already have some folks who are, are doing some of the various things like Bruce always does the Salvation Army uh, bell ringing. Um, Susan Ribbonall um, heads up the um, shopping for the Salvation Army at Christmas. So, but if you'd like to join my committee, I'd really love to have you and we'll find something for you to, to do. Thanks. Thanks, Bonnie. Not working, Dave. Not working. There you are. Better. We got you. Can anybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, did we do the pledge? We did. We're done. <laughs> uh, okay, very good. Um, and it sounds like Bonnie had an announcement. Do we have any other announcements this morning? Hey guys, this is Amber. I have an announcement. Um, I, I don't know how we coordinate and Bonnie, maybe this would be maybe talking to the committee, but I sit on the YWCA board of Central Ohio and we had a fire a couple weeks ago at our women's center and they are looking for donations. So I don't know if it's something, maybe I bring it to the committee, the community committee. But um, I don't know if we want to do more or if we want to do something for the YWCA, I can get more details, Bonnie, if that's your committee. I think, David, that would be more of a, I think that'd be more of a grant request, a one-time grant request, but. Yeah. 
you would, um, we can, uh, if you can fill out the, the grant request form. Okay. And get it to us. Um, we have a board meeting um, first Wednesday of April, which is coming up, and then we, we vote on the grant request okay. at that meeting. Are they looking for like clothing donations or money? No, I, um, well, <laughs> any help. I mean, they, so there's 90 ladies down at the Women's Center and unfortunately one had passed away, not from fire related, but was found that evening of other complications. Um, so they're really looking for any kind of supplies. Like I know my company did a lot of gift cards to Walmart so they could go and replace some stuff that they, they lost because of the smoke. Um, so, I mean, they have a list of donations they could do and then, you know, obviously don't, um, money donations too. So I, I'll fill out that request, but if, if anyone thinks of anything else we could do, just let me know. David, you're on mute. Muted, David. How can you hear me? Oh, mm, a little bit. He, he showed up in another spot. So yes, yeah, my, my computer connection isn't working, so I'm, I'm in on my iPhone. Today, iPhone. I don't know which is better or worse. Um, how about guests this morning? Do we have any guests? Do you have a guest? Introduce them or introduce yourself. If you I know David's having some some issues uh, with his microphone. I know David has some problems with his with his microphone, but we do have an induction today. Uh, I'm very excited that we have a new member to our club, uh, Lyle Brown. Um, he was a former member of the Tri Village Rotary Club. Uh, he's a resident of Dublin. Uh, Roland is actually his sponsor. Uh, he's very interested in the vocational services, chaplain, and in a vacation. And he is a former Paul Harris uh, fellow. So welcome to the club, uh, Lyle. Anything you'd like to say to introduce yourself? We're very excited to have you. Yes, thank you very much. I very much appreciate yes, very much. the opportunity to join the club. Uh, I'm an attorney uh, with Steptoe and Johnson, and I help uh, my clients um, solve problems and protect their interests through litigation in federal and state courts in Ohio. Uh, my wife, Sheila, and I live here in Dublin with our two sons. And uh, I'm not new to Rotary. Uh, during my time with Tri Village, I was the president of the club in the 2015-2016 timeframe. And finally, I'd just like to thank everybody from the club for welcoming me. It's, I've been to a number of meetings as a guest and I, just, I can just tell it's a wonderful club. A uh, great group of people, so I'm very excited to join. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Lyle. We're excited to have you. Welcome. Welcome, Lyle. I, I don't have uh, any good connection. Do we have any guests or other announcements that we need to announce? Yes, uh, I'm going to collect uh, one week late, but I'm going to collect for uh, food pantry next week. So if you've got any food stuffs, you can bring it to David's front door. Or if you don't want to drop it off at his door, you can take it directly to the food pantry, sign it in as Dublin Rotary. And uh, I will put out a memo on Monday. Thank you. Okay, any other announcements? All right, well, let's, let's move then uh, to Calvin Gebhardt to introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Steve Fine, do we have you out there? Don't know, but I'll go ahead and read his, inter his bio. Steve Fine is president of the uh, Melanoma Education Foundation, attended colleges in the Boston area, receiving a doctorate in chemistry from Northeastern University. 
He then moved to Pennsylvania, completing a year of postdoctoral research at Lehigh University. After five years as an assistant professor of chemistry at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, he moved back to New England where he served in technical and management positions in high tech um, chemical companies. In 1989, he started a consulting practice in the technology of high purity chemical manufacturing, concurrently serving for three years as vice president of technology for ACSI, a West Coast manufacturer of semiconductor companies. In 1989, he started a consulting practice in the technology of, of uh, I'm sorry, I got that. Shortly after his son, Dan, died of melanoma in 1998 at the age of 26, he founded the nonprofit Melanoma Education Foundation and since August of 2001 has devoted full time to the foundation. The primary activity of the foundation is educating high school and middle school wellness teachers about melanoma skin cancer and providing them with free online lessons to educate their students about self-detecting melanoma while it is curable. At the last count, over 1,700 schools in all 50 states were using the lessons. Steve Fine, welcome to Dublin AM Rotary. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Well, I, um, I'm very excited to uh, have been invited to speak today. And, um, and I've been listening in on, on um, the meeting and uh, oh, what a great group of people. Anyways, uh, I want to get right to the presentation. Um, it's divided into several parts. And I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about the statistics of melanoma. Then we'll talk about the risk factors, the warning signs, the role of ultraviolet radiation in causing melanoma. And then uh, talk a little bit about sun protection. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding around that topic. These are photos of young people who lost their lives to melanoma and it ranges in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, I'm sorry, the upper left uh, photo is uh, Bethany Cobb. She was 11 years old when she passed away from melanoma. On the bottom right is um, Carrie McCarthy. She was 35. And uh, you, you think of cancer as being a disease of aging, but melanoma can affect you at just about any age. There are more than five times the number of new melanoma cases expected in 2021 than there are HIV AIDS cases. And that's ironic because almost every high school student graduates knowing about HIV and AIDS, but relatively few know about melanoma in spite of it being much more prevalent, far deadlier, and that they are vulnerable to it as teens. Oops. Got a little bit ahead of myself. On the average, somebody dies of melanoma in the US every hour. And a quarter of all new melanoma cases occur in people under age 40. In the mid 20s to the late 20s, it's the most prevalent of all cancers. And in women who are under 39, it's second only to breast cancer. It's also one of the few cancers that's increasing at an epidemic rate. There are a couple of redeeming features though. First of all, it's just about the easiest cancer for you to find by yourself at an early stage. And when you find it early, it's, it's almost guaranteed to be curable. And curing it means going to a uh, doctor's office, preferably a dermatologist, getting a shot of local anesthetic and 15 or 20 minutes later, you're cured permanently without the need for any chemo or radiation. But again, the key is you have to find it early. About 30% of new melanomas arise from a pre-existing mole. The ones on top are normal moles and normal moles have sharp a quarter of an inch in diameter. On the bottom are atypical moles and they have usually have one or more fuzzy borders, uh, non-uniform shade, a fried egg surface, 
and they are typically more than a quarter of an inch in diameter. So the moles on the left, both top and bottom, are flat. The ones on the right are raised, and that has no bearing on whether a mole is normal or atypical. But if you look at the bottom right, you see a raised atypical mole. It looks like a yolk surrounded by a flat fuzzy area. There's two kinds of risk factors for melanoma. The kind that you're born with and can't do anything about and the controllable kind, which you can do something about. Among the inherited factors, if you have more than 50 moles, um, that's a risk factor. If you have any atypical moles, even one, that's a risk factor. If you have any of the features associated with sun sensitive skin, like fair skin, uh, blue or green eyes, red or blonde hair, uh, all of those are risk factors. And if you have a family or personal history of any kind of skin cancer, that's a risk factor. There's very few of us who don't have at least one of those risk factors and many of us have multiple factors. Among the controllable factors, there are three that stand out. If you've had any blistering sunburns under the age of 20, if you've had just one, that doubles your lifetime risk of melanoma. If you've had three or more, that increases your risk by a factor of five. If you intermittently expose skin that's normally covered to strong sunlight, that's a risk factor. And that's believed to be the reason why the chance of getting melanoma is as high or higher in the Northern states as it is in most of the Sunbelt states. The worst thing you can do to give yourself melanoma is to be a regular user of tanning beds. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a short while. Anybody can get melanoma. Uh, Bob Marley was a reggae singer from Jamaica and he died at the age of 36. His melanoma began under the toenail, a large toenail. And by the time anyone knew what was going on, it had spread to his brain. He actually died of melanoma tumors on his brain. More recently, Dr. Matori, who was a breast cancer surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, died of melanoma at age 48. Her melanoma began on her scalp and it was hidden by her hair until it was too late. This is a simulated progression of an atypical mole into a melanoma. And as you watch it change, uh, change is by far the biggest warning sign of melanoma, change in a mole or other growth that you have on your skin. The most common changes are size, color, and shape. And you can see those changes in all of the simulated progression. But another change is the surface, the texture of it, the way it feels to the touch. And the most dangerous change of all is thickness, uh, the appearance of little bumps or an overall elevation increase in a mole. A new mole that shows up out of the blue wasn't there a couple of weeks ago and there it is and it seems to be growing. That's especially true if you don't have a lot of moles or if the new one looks different from those that you do have. What you don't want to do is wait for the non-visual warning signs like bleeding or ulceration or itching because by then you may be compromising your chance of survival. There are two types of melanoma and they're called radial and nodular. Radial melanomas usually spread out on the surface of the skin before they do anything else. And they're, for that reason, they're pretty easy to detect. They're also unusual looking, they can look ugly. Uh, nodular melanomas grow mostly downward beneath the skin where you can't see them. Fortunately, a little bit of that growth occurs above the skin, sort of like an iceberg. Uh, and nodular melanomas may look innocent and they can be more difficult to self-detect than radial melanomas. These are four photos of radial melanomas and uh, about 80% of all melanomas are radial. Their growth is two dimensional at first, but they always have, well, they usually have two or more ABCD properties. A is asymmetry and it means that if you draw an imaginary line through the center of any of these moles, one half will not be a mirror image reflection of the other half. B is for border. The borders of melanomas are usually irregular or uneven. 
uh, the colors of melanomas, the sea change, can be multiple. And you can see that, especially in the uh, far left photo and the far right photo, where you see different colors. And the diameters of radiomelanomas are usually more than a quarter of an inch, even in the pretty early stages. Now, every melanoma, regardless of whether it's radial or nodular, eventually begins to grow vertically beneath the surface. And what you see here are three photos at different stages of vertical growth. The one on the left has just begun vertical growth and you can see little dark bumps at the uh, lower left and the upper right. And that melanoma is probably gonna be curable. The one in the middle is intermediate vertical growth, as you see that uh, nodule at the top of the uh, melanoma. And uh, time will tell whether it's curable or not. The one on the right is an example of advanced vertical growth and was fatal. And again, most of the growth in these melanomas is beneath the surface. And what you're seeing here is the tip, kind of the tip of the iceberg, the growth above the surface. What varies among the different kinds of melanoma is how long it takes for that vertical growth to begin because that's the most dangerous part of melanoma development. So why is thickness so important? Well, if you look at radial melanomas, they start in the thin outer layer of the skin, the epidermis. And when they're confined to that layer, they're non-invasive and they're easily curable in a 15 or 20 minute visit to your dermatologist. When they reach the uh, border between the epidermis and the thicker underlying dermis, they enter the invasive radial growth phase. At that point, they're still about uh, 80, 90% curable. But then as they begin to grow beneath uh, into the dermis, penetrate into the dermis, uh, that's the invasive vertical growth phase, and that's the most dangerous phase. Now, at about one millimeter of depth, you're still about 80% curable. By the time you reach four millimeters, you're about, you're less than 50% curable. And if, when the melanoma penetrates into the subcutaneous layers, uh, uh, mostly incurable. So why is that? Well, as the melanoma grows, it begins to release cancerous cells. And the deeper it is in the skin, the more likely it is that there are gonna be lymph vessels and blood vessels that can pick up some of those cells and carry them anywhere in the body. So these are four examples of nodular melanomas. The one on the far left is in flesh colored oval shaped melanoma on an earlobe. Uh, that was about two millimeters thick, so time will tell whether it's curable. The one on the, the, the next one in is a early stage nodular melanoma, and that's very likely going to be curable, as is the third one in, which is also a nodular melanoma. Unfortunately, the last one on the right was an advanced growth nodular melanoma. It was on the ankle of a 12-year-old boy, and it was fatal. So usually nodular melanomas don't show the ABCD signs. Uh, they usually start in clear skin. They can look innocent, both in the appearance and in the color. But the saving grace is that they always exhibit all three signs that are called the EFG signs. E is elevated. It means it has to be elevated partly or completely above the surface of the skin. F is uh, firm to the touch, uh, not flabby. If it's flabby, it's probably just a harmless skin tag. And G is growing. It has to be growing more than two weeks. Now, a lot of growths will uh, pop up on the skin, a, a new zit, for example. It'll grow for a week or two, then it'll stop growing. It may even start to fade or shrink. But melanomas are out of control cancers. And once they start growing, they don't stop. For nodular melanomas, the window of opportunity from the time it first becomes visible on the skin can be as little as three months. For radiomelanomas, it's generally between six and 12 months. Melanoma is unusual in that it can occur anywhere on the body, unlike most other skin cancers, which tend to occur 
mainly on sun exposed areas. In white males, the most common location of melanomas are the back. And in white females, it's the lower legs, especially the back of the lower legs. And those are areas which tend to get heavy exposure during the summer months, but little or none during the rest of the year. And again, you're seeing the effect of uh, that risk factor of intermittent exposure of normally covered skin to strong sunlight. In darker skin population, the most common location for melanomas are the feet and the hands, um, the feet more so than the hands. So how do you check your skin to see if you have a growth that needs to be called to the attention of, of a, um, of a uh, the dermatologist, well, you need two mirrors, a wall mirror in a well-lighted room like your bathroom and a hand mirror that has a long handle so that you can hold it behind your neck, behind your back, move it. Uh, and as you're doing that, you look into the wall mirror to see what's being reflected in the hand mirror. And that way you can check your entire body by yourself. You also need a hairbrush or a dryer to part your hair because melanomas can begin on the scalp. The name of the game is to be thorough. You wanna check head to toes, front, back, sides, and scalp. And if you have a tough time checking your back or scalp, get a family member or a close friend to help out. And the good news is you only need to check once every month. But if you do that, you drastically decrease your chance of dying from melanoma. People who do this regularly almost never die from melanoma. So now that you know a little bit about melanoma, i um, got a little quiz for you. These are six skin growths and three of them were melanomas, three of them were benign. So in the next 10 seconds or so, either make a mental note or write down the numbers of the uh, images that you think were melanomas. And then I'll show you which ones really were. Okay, let me show you the ones that were melanomas. The red arrows show them. And you're probably gonna be surprised at this, uh, but don't feel badly, this was a trick question. I didn't tell you something very important about these growths. And what that important thing was, was what did these look like a month or two before these photos were taken? Appearance alone is often not enough to clue you in that you may have a possible melanoma. You also need to know the history. And the only way you can get that history is to check your skin regularly. All right, now I'd like to talk about uh, the role of ultraviolet radiation in uh, increasing your risk of melanoma. The sun releases a large spectrum of radiation uh, and you can categorize it according to low energy on the right, high energy on the left. Well, starting on the low energy side is infrared. When you feel the warmth of the sun, it's due to infrared radiation. And in normal amounts, that's not going to harm you. When you see the colors around you, it's due to visible radiation. And obviously that doesn't harm you either. But as you start to move toward the higher energy region, you encounter ultraviolet radiation. And that definitely is harmful. And the two kinds that we're concerned about are UVA and UVB. And both of them increase your risk of melanoma and other skin cancers. If you go to the very high energy region, you encounter a, a UVC, ultra high uh, ultraviolet radiation and X radiation, but fortunately none of those reach the surface of the earth. They're absorbed by the atmosphere. So I want to focus in on UVA and UVB. Uh, UVB is the radiation that you get mostly from the sun. It's the kind that causes sunburns. UVA, um, you get primarily from tanning lamps, especially tanning beds. And the difference between them is that UVB doesn't penetrate very far down, but it can cause severe sunburns. UVA penetrates much more deeply, gets into the dermis, and it can cause DNA changes within the genes of the cells of your skin. So both kinds of radiation can cause melanoma and other skin cancers. UVB doesn't burn, I'm sorry, UVB does burn, UVA generally does not burn. 
when you see the SPF rating on a sunscreen, that refers to how well it protects your skin um, if you apply it properly. That's a big if, by the way. UVA, as I said, uh, doesn't cause sunburns. This is an illustration of uh, tanning bed damage. Um, and my son actually did, who's a graphic designer, actually did this uh, uh, simulated photo. It was, he, he superimposed a, a photo of a skeleton that had been filled in with clay and then put a, a Barbie bikini on it. And he superimposed that on a tanning bed. Anyways, uh, the ultraviolet A radiation that you get from tanning beds is more than 10 times stronger than what you would get from the sun in that same period of time. Um, ultraviolet B intensity from tanning beds is about the same as from the sun. And that's why people with very sensitive skin will sometimes come out of a tanning bed session with a sunburn. If you are under age 35 and you have a single tanning bed session, you're increasing your melanoma risk by 22%. And every additional session increases it by another 22%. If you're under 30 and you use tanning beds more than 10 times in a year, you're increasing your melanoma risk by a factor of eight. So if you wanna get a tan and you don't wanna risk skin cancer or, or getting wrinkly skin before your time, there's only one safe way to do it and that's to use a sunless bronzer. And sunless bronzers have dyes in them that only are absorbed by dead skin cells. And you, can, you can't harm anything that's already dead. So these dyes will not penetrate into the living cells. A couple of options for getting that kind of uh, tan. If you're in a hurry, you can use a spray booth, only takes two or three minutes. Uh, a better option, which is more controllable, is to buy a do-it-yourself bronzer over the counter. When you mention artificial tanners, people say, oh, no, you get an orange color with that. Well, you only get an orange color if you choose too dark a tanner for your normal skin color. The, the best advice is to use a tanner which is only a little darker than your normal skin color and build up your tan over a few sessions rather than trying to do it all at once with a dark tanner. You can also test out any tanner in advance by applying it on a hidden area like your back, maybe 24 hours in advance, and then check it to see whether you're happy with the resulting color. There's a website, it's a .com website, but it's not commercial. It was formed by a woman who lost a family member to melanoma. It's called sunless.com. Uh, has good information, including a, an area where you input the answers to their questions, and it then tells you, gives you some options for sunless tanners that they would recommend based on your input. Okay, now sunscreen, uh, which is a topic of a, whoops, I got ahead of myself. Um, how do you choose the right sunscreen? Well, you want to get one that has broad spectrum protection. That means it protects about against UVA and UVB. Um, the only ingredients in sunscreen that are currently approved by the Food and Drug Administration are zinc oxide and titanium oxide. So, and zinc oxide is the more common one. It's a very good broad spectrum protectant. You can't go wrong if you look for a sunscreen that has zinc oxide in it. The place on people's skin where they tend to under apply or not apply sunscreen is are the, unfortunately the most sensitive areas. And they're the nose, the lips, especially the bottom lip and the tops of the ears. And um, what we recommend for that is use a sunblock stick instead of sunscreen lotion. Even something as simple as a chap aid with, with an SPF rating on it will work. And it won't run into your mouth or your nose or your eyes and it'll stay on your skin for longer than a sunblock lotion or a sunscreen lotion will. Now, the thing that causes a lot of confusion in sunscreens is the SPF rating. And it turns out that the SPF rating is absolutely meaningless unless you apply it heavily. And most users apply only about a quarter to a third of, a third of the required amount to get the rated SPF. So let's suppose you have 
a very high SPF sunscreen, SPF 100, and you only apply a quarter or 25% of the required amount, what do you think your actual SPF is? And I'll give you a few seconds to uh, think about that. And I'll bet that most of you thought that it was 25. Actually, the SPF is 3.1. So it's far lower than what you might expect. And that's because there's an exponential relationship between the thickness of the sunscreen film that you apply and the actual SPF that your skin sees. All right, so we have a website called skincheck.org. Actually, we have two websites. Uh, there's much more information on it, photos of melanomas, descriptions from people who had melanomas that didn't look like typical ones. It's a very user-friendly site. And there's a video at the very top of the first page of the site um, that has all of the information that uh, I've just spoken about and more. It's about 30 minutes long. I uh, highly recommend that if you want to follow up on this, that you check out that video. Also tells you about the uh, background of the Melanoma Education Foundation. And that site has experienced close to 40 million hits since it was first put online. We also have another website for health educators. And that one is at uh, melanomaeducation.net. Okay, so I'm going to turn on, I'm going to end the show and turn on the camera so you can see my homely face. We'll quit out of here. And I can find the place where I turn on the camera. Okay, having a little bit of difficulty here. Well, not sure what this is. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not seeing the camera control here. Oh, wait, all right. I see it. Here it is. Okay. If you can stop sharing your screen, that would help as well. Okay, good idea. Stop share. Ah, there we go. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, anyways, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Steve, I, I have a question. Um, those of us who in our in our youth were ignorant about about this stuff and went out in the sun for many years without sunscreen and uh, did things that nowadays we wouldn't do. Um, are we kind of doomed? Uh, or, well, you're not, or, no, you're not doomed, but, um, you know, early exposure to sun uh, is a high risk factor. So it means that you have an above average risk of getting melanoma compared to someone who has similar genetic characteristics, but who didn't spend a lot of time in the sun. Uh, and that's why it's so important if you've, if you've had a lot of sun exposure that you do that regular self check um, and we recommend doing it every month. You just can't go wrong doing it that way. And uh, so you're not doomed. You won't die of melanoma, but the key is checking your skin regularly. Uh, and how frequently do you recommend going to a dermatologist for a check? Well, we recommend, you know, if you've not been to a dermatologist, going for a baseline check. And that way the dermatologist can identify anything that you need to keep uh, control of or watch. But ordinarily, you know, for an average person, once per year is enough. Uh, but we also recommend going to a, um, an ophthalmologist once a year because you can actually get melanoma in your eyes. And even if you don't, sun exposure uh, greatly increases your risk of cataracts. And we also recommend getting a dental checkup at least once a year because, believe it or not, you can get melanoma in your mouth. Hmm. So, Steve, you had mentioned um, in the youth population, is there a guideline for dermatology in the youth or is that 
I mean, I know my pediatrician checks over my children, but um, do, you, do you guys recommend that the youth under 18 goes to a dermatologist once a year as well? I, yeah, I think pediatricians are, are pretty much aware. And as long as you tell them, uh, ask them to do a complete skin exam, a complete surface exam, um, uh, they should be into it. And if they say, well, why do that? Then, <laughs> then you might want to consider going to a dermatologist. But um, melanoma is rare under preteen. It tends to start at about... Uh, uh, 11, 12, even 10 years old. Uh, the worst case that I ever heard really uh, blew me away was uh, a health teacher who I went to a school and did a teacher training session with. And uh, she had a, I don't know if it was a nephew or a niece, but some relative who uh, developed a melanoma at the age of one year. And, but that's extremely rare. Uh, Stephen, uh, have there been any advances in treating melanoma? I mean, uh, there have been, you know, yeah, melanoma. there have been some wonderful advances with immunotherapy in recent years. Um, and to the point where some of them cause long remission or promote long remissions. Uh, you know, I think we're not there yet. Um, less than 50% of advanced melanoma patients benefit from these immunotherapies. And one of the downsides is most of them have very severe side effects, even life-threatening side effects. Um, so, you know, the, you don't want to go there if you don't have to. And the way that to avoid it is to check your skin regularly and know what's on your skin, get to, get to be very familiar with the things on your skin. There's a couple of questions in the in the chat, uh, Stephen. Uh, one was, how can you find a melanoma under the nail? Can you see it? Oh yeah, you'll see it. It'll look like a uh, dark streak. Um, a little bit challenging to to differentiate it from a fungal infection. Uh, but the key thing is, if you have, uh, if it's gone too long it will show as a black streak, not only under the nail, but in the bed of the nail. Uh, and that's, that, that indicates that uh, you better get to a, a dermatologist real quick. But, but you will see it, you, you can see it. it. In fact, if you go to our website, skincheck.org, um, there are photos of that kind of melanoma. Are you willing to share your PowerPoint slides with us or? I would be happy to, to send them to you if you like. Uh, well, you probably have Calvin's email address, I would think. So if you can send them to Calvin, he can forward them on. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. Any other questions? We got time for one more, if anybody has one. Okay. And if anyone wants to um, remain after the time is up, since you're on a Zoom meeting, I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions that may come up, maybe ones that you want answered in private. Well, if not, uh, we thank you for being here today, Steve. The, the information is really great. Um, I learned a lot and know what to look for and what to do now that I didn't know coming into this. So. Uh, thank you very much for your expertise and for sharing with us. Well, it's my pleasure and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it, it, it's my pleasure okay. and, uh, you know, check out that website. A uh, lot of very, very comprehensive and very user-friendly information on it. So I hope, hope you all have a good day and you're all immunized. I was listening to some of you talk about your uh, getting your shots so that's great. And uh, I'm immunized too, but even if I wasn't immunized, you can't transmit uh, COVID-19 over the airwaves. <laughs> Not yet anyway. So take care everyone, thanks again. So everybody has an assignment before our next meeting. You have to do your self skin check in addition to getting your COVID vaccine if you have.
Um, all right. Uh, I want to welcome Lyle Brown as a new member again. I was having technical problems early on in the meeting, and uh, I apologize for that. Um, but we're really happy to have Lyle as part of our club. And now I think we have at least two or three litigators in our club. So I think we're well covered with attorneys. Um, next week, April 2nd, we do not have a meeting. That will be Easter weekend. And so there is no meeting next Friday, April 2nd. Our next meeting will be two weeks from today, April 8th. And at that meeting, we will um, hear our annual, our annual our annual update from the Rotary Interact Clubs. Um, our quote of the week is an Easter quote from Kate McGann. The very first Easter taught us this, that life never ends and love never dies. Everybody have a great Easter weekend, and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Bye-bye.